Greetings. I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Today, we discuss one of the most famous cases of resistance to scientific fact, Galileo's efforts to convince the church authorities, dominant at that time, that the Earth was not the center of the universe. Our distinguished guest is astrophysicist and popular author, Dr. Mario Livio. Dr. Livio's latest book, Galileo and the Science Deniers, here it is, uh, is especially uh, timely uh, as an account of Galileo's effort struggle against church doctrine and his humiliating punishment by the Inquisition. Dr. Livio compares, importantly in this book, the denial of science fact in the 1600s with the anti-science situation of today, very evident in the anti-climate change groups, the anti-evolution, anti-vaccine, and so forth. Dr. Livio was a senior phys astrophysicist, excuse me, from 1991 to 2015 with the Space Telescope Science Institute, which operates the Hubble Space Telescope. He's a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and has received numerous awards and recognitions for his research. Dr. Livio's career as an astrophysicist has been coupled with his commitment to making science accessible to the public. He's given many public seminars and presentations at prominent institutions such as the Smithsonian and um, the New York uh, Hayden Planetarium. He's also the author of numerous science books for the general public. His book is God, a Mathematician, um, was the inspiration for the NOVA program, The Great Math Mystery, which you should see. It is available in library, DVD, and so forth. And this was nominated for an Emmy in 2016. In addition to his appearance in that and other NOVA productions, he's been featured in many programs such as Science Friday and All Things Considered. It is a very great honor to welcome Dr. Mario Livio. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. And Dr. Livio, I would like, this is a big story, and this is a wonderful book. There are many, many books on Galileo, but this one connects very importantly to a situation today that kind of parallels the one that Galileo experienced, and it's very painful for scientists. Um, could you begin with a little background about Galileo? I don't know that people are broadly aware of just how gifted he was. We think of him as a scientist and mathematician more, uh, but he uh, was uh, fabulous in a number of ways and his family was extraordinary. And nobody understands that like you do, who under you are very into the arts as well. Could you give us a little background on his on him? Uh, yes. So uh, his father was a musician and a music theorist, <clears throat> and uh, he probably participated with his father in uh, trying to prove that uh, you know pleasant sounds don't only depend on the length of the <laughs> of the <laughs> strings and things like that. Um, he himself got uh, an education in the arts. Uh, he actually studied at the School of Drawing um, and in, you know, what we would call today liberal arts. Uh, he was, uh, he liked poetry. Uh, uh, he could cite entire parts from Dante um, and he in particular liked poet Ariosto. He even wrote a whole essay comparing Ariosto to another poet, Paso, uh, only to show that Ariosto was superior. Um, at the age of 24, uh, he gave uh, a lecture, two lectures actually, to the Florentine Academy about the location and structure of Dante's Inferno uh, in the Divine Comedy. Um, he had friends who were painters and so on. So yes. 
he was he, he, he didn't just live in late Renaissance. He was in some ways he a really, Renaissance person. <laughs> he was the embodiment of it. He yeah. really was. And you make that brilliantly clear. It's wonderful to read about what a comprehensive intellect he was. Um, and then in this period, the other thing is this interesting period where there is a very painful, slow emergence of modern science out of the background of uh, mysticism, magic, uh, heavy-duty religion, and so on. The, the science had a difficult time becoming independent. Could you give us an idea of that? And I'd like to include the uh, development of printing, which you made a very big point of there, too, the just general background. Yes. So, of course, you know, I mean, it's not that there wasn't science before right. that. I mean, you know, the ancient Greeks of course, had the <laughs> history of mathematics, uh, and, and so did the Babylonians, and so on. Uh, and uh, things don't happen all of us out of the blue, you know. I mean, even during the Middle Ages, which we uh, normally talk about as if these were dark ages, I mean, there were scientists there, there were mathematicians yes. there. I mean, things progressed. Um, uh, but uh, it is true that, uh, you know, at that time of uh, Galileo and so on, uh, there was a sort of a revolution uh, which started in some ways with Copernicus, of course, who departed from the old Aristotelian uh, Ptolemaic model in which the Earth was at the center and all the, the sun and all the other planets revolved around it. Uh, Copernicus, of course, uh, uh, suggested a different model in which the sun was at the center, the earth was just another planet. And uh, those things started to take root at that point. I mean, uh, uh, astronomers such as Johannes Kepler um, adopted that uh, and, 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 you know, immediately accepted it. Um, Galileo, actually not right from the start, I think, adopted it. He, he wrote one book which actually uh, he still uh, described the Ptolemaic system, uh, but then later uh, indeed uh, adopted it as well. So, uh, yes, we see this birth, if you like, of what we might call modern science. Not of right. science, because there was science before that, right. but, but birth of modern science. Uh, certainly Galileo was free uh, to a large extent of mysticism and things which, uh, yes. you know, uh, even great scientists like Kepler still, you know, had some mysticism about right. his thinking and so on. Right, right. I just wanted to get clear that sort of background that we're, we're still in a heavy period of that kind of more mystical uh, orientation and that, as you say, even the scientists hadn't departed that completely. But uh, also... Before, I want to get more background on this Aristotelian cosmos and the Copernican cosmos next, but very briefly, could you tell us what printing did? This is in the 1500s, but it makes a huge difference, it seems like. Yeah, so printing, you, you know, I think printing was to the, the 1500s and 1600s like what, uh, I don't know, what uh, internet and social exactly. media are for today, because all of a sudden, uh, people could relatively more easily get books. Uh, people across different countries could get the same books, which was very important. Uh, you know, it, it was important not just for science. I mean, even the Bible, you know, okay, yeah, people right. could get the same edition of the Bible. Uh, people started printing old mathematics books of the Greeks uh, right. and, and so on. So, so this became, uh, there was a democratization, uh, if you like, uh, uh, you know, that of, of, the, of knowledge, not just of science, but of knowledge. I mean, that suddenly you didn't have to be this uh, rich person who could get this book, you know, written right. by scribes. <laughs> <laughs> it was very expensive and so on. So, right. yeah, so, and, and uh, Galileo certainly benefited from that uh, type. Yes. Of uh, also, yeah. it, is it true that they were, with this whole uh, printing, 
a business, things, including the Bible, were printed in languages of the populations, not just in Latin or in, say, in the old Greek, that, that, but they were pop, more popular languages. Yeah, yeah, some of that happened, and Galileo actually made it a point in his own writing, and he wrote some of his important books, insisted on writing them in Italian rather than in Latin, where, you know, most science books at the time were, were written in Latin because he wanted to make them accessible to a larger audience. Right. Uh, thank you for that, because that's another thing that's quickly, uh, well, we don't hear a whole lot about it, and it made apparently a big difference uh, all around. Now I'd like to ask about this Aristotelian cosmos. Why was that so powerful? Why was that hard to relinquish? And then we go to Copernican cosmos. <laughs> yes. So, uh you know, Aristotelian cosmology, if you like, uh, held for many, many centuries. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, to him, there was this difference between celestial things and terrestrial things. So there were things on Earth which could be corrupted, could die, had blemishes and so on. And there, were, there was this perfect world of, you know, of the quintessence and, you know, everything perfect in the sun, in the sky, sorry. And, and the earth was then the center of things. Uh, and for example, you know, all these the objects either fell down because they wanted to go to the center of the earth or went up, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like smoke or something, you know, which they wanted to go to the other parts. So they had these natural tendencies. He, he, he applied these tendencies to objects. Now, this general philosophy was, uh, the church adopted it very willingly because it has put the earth and the humans on it, uh, you know, at the center of creation. Um, so, so it was very, very, it fitted very well with, you know, ideas, biblical ideas and so on that humans, you know, are the, the, at the end, the ultimate, uh, you know, creation and so on. And, and, and so they adopted this as their orthodoxy. And, and that, of course, helped um, the longevity of, of these ideas. I see. Now, here's a thing that to me is curious be, to get into Galileo's uh, investigations before him, there is Copernicus, and Copernicus had to deal with the church also, and he got away with it. <laughs> he was had a more sympathetic pope, or what was that? That it was an interesting idea. It didn't replace the Aristotelian. No, he was, he was also politically more cautious. Oh. His, book, his book appeared only after his death. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> So, so uh, you know, so he during his lifetime he actually saw no uh, no serious objections from the church. Ah, uh, thank you for that. Really after his death, uh, but also um, to be fair, I mean, not very many people read his book. Uh, ah, so, ah. so uh, uh, you know, so it wasn't that well known. I um, see. Whereas Galileo was producing book after book and also very popular out there, getting around out there. And he was also more vocal and more... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and more obnoxious. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you said that. <laughs> uh, uh, could we go then to Galileo's investigate? I mean, it's much broader than just this. This is a big thing to develop slowly his Copernican view, or I should say to accept that Copernican view, but he did a lot of things. Could you tell us his, uh, about his amazing gifts? Yeah, he, he, he uh, look, first of all, there, is a, there was something that's conceptually very important. I mean, he, he introduced this idea. He was one of those people who introduced what we today call the scientific method. Which means, you know, you have, first of all, to observe facts. 
then uh, you know you do experiments to find out facts. You, you don't just you know think about them. You do experiments <laughs> to actually find out facts, and then by the time you go to theorizing, uh, the theory that you do has to explain all the known facts and has to also make some predictions about facts we still don't know. And, and he introduced that. So, for example, he studied free fall. So mm -hmm. he wanted to study free fall, so he did lots of experiments with inclined planes. I mean, inclined planes in itself was an ingenious idea because there were no good clocks at the time. So, you know, you want to measure how fast two things fall, but they fall very fast. It was hard to measure the differences in times. But by rolling balls down inclined planes, which he could make at a very low angle, at a very small angle, you know, he, he slowed down the motion and could make the measurements more accurately. So Tim, he did many experiments with that. And actually, his last book was mostly about his experiments in mechanics. He, he waited a long time to write that book. Um, of course, that influenced Newton too, I think. Yes. Sorry. Did that influence Newton? Uh, uh, yes, but but only to a small extent. Okay. I must say. Yes, to a small extent. Yes, he mentions Galileo, but but not not profusely. I mean, yes. Okay. Um, he also, uh, of course, did uh, things with a, many discoveries with a telescope. I mean, yeah. he didn't invent the telescope. But as soon as he heard that the telescope was invented in the Netherlands, he started constructing his own telescopes. And very quickly, he got uh, telescopes with a power of more than 20, while the available telescopes before him had only a power of about four. So he perfected the telescope and started using it to observe the heavens. Uh, and there he made many discoveries. Uh, I'll just mention, you know, he discovered that the surface of the moon is uh, filled with mountains and craters and whatnot. It's a bit like the Earth. Uh, he discovered the four satellites of Jupiter. Uh, he, he showed that the Milky Way is composed of many stars, really, you know, and things like that. Um, he showed that Venus has phases just like the moon. Um, uh, and, and, and so on. So, so and all of these discoveries to help destroy the Ptolemaic model, um, they did not quite prove that the Earth was moving around the sun. That he actually <laughs> never managed to actually prove. But, but he did show that, um, that the Ptolemaic model in which everything revolved around the Earth certainly could not uh, be true. So yeah, he did all of that. And one other contribution which was essential was his declaration that nature is written in the language of mathematics. Yes, uh, yes. this was a fantastic, actually, uh, intuition. Because, you know, at the time, there were still not many what we call today laws of nature, which are written as mathematical formulae. And in fact, he wrote a couple of the very first ones himself. Uh, but he had this still this intuition that you know it's mathematics that is going to explain it all. Uh, and of course, that turned out to be the way we actually do science today. Yes, uh, and again, this is uh, something that you are such a, an expert on. It's wonderful to hear your contribution in that in the book that uh, you've described that so well. This is a huge leap. And so um, then he slowly, and you're kind of alluding to that, shifted to a Copernican view, where uh, a heliocentric view. Could you uh, tell us more about that uh, idea. Y yes, so uh, as I said, you know, Copernicus suggested that and, and he adopted that. Uh, the idea was, of course, that the sun is at the center and all the planets revolve around the sun. Um, and uh, there were many objections to that. Uh, and, and the objections came from all kinds of parts and had various reasons. Like, for example, I mean, people said, oh, 
if the earth is just another planet, how come that only the earth has a moon and the other planets don't have moon? Well, Galileo showed that Jupiter has four moons. So, you know, there fell this objection. Then somebody said, ah, but you know, how is it possible that the earth moves around the sun and it doesn't lose its moon? Well, there was Jupiter and it was revolving around something, choose whatever you want, the earth or the sun, and it wasn't losing its four moons. So, you know, there fell that kind of objection. Um, the phases of Venus was a fantastic discovery because uh, that was specifically predicted to happen in the Copernican model, mm. was not predicted to happen in the Ptolemaic model. Um, I mentioned already that there was a hybrid model uh, yes. that uh, astronomer Tycho <laughs> Brahe suggested. Yes where all the other planets revolved around the sun, but the sun itself revolves around the earth. That one actually Galileo never managed to really kill. He, he thought he killed it by his model for sea tides, but his model was completely wrong. So he didn't kill it. Um, and, 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 and actually some of the church scientists, I mean, the church itself had some important scientists and important mathematicians. Uh, but of course, you know, they were not happy to completely change their mind. So they had as a fallback position, the Brahe model, which was this hybrid model. And they decided to adopt that uh, because as I said, Galileo didn't quite manage to prove that the earth itself was moving. So they, it was really a protracted kind of effort there to get anybody totally convinced, evidently. But the, 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 and it's so hard for us at this time to understand, appreciate how difficult this was. You mentioned his several books, and I'd like to just bring that out. Uh, the, in passing, we don't have time to really dwell on it, but his books also managed to get him in trouble. So, but the uh, it's very important to realize how much of an impact his books had, especially on the authorities, apparently, who didn't appreciate his effort. Uh, but I'd like to just mention that, that it, you go into some detail in your book on that. Uh, Dr. Livio, could we now talk about the struggle with the church at this time that Galileo tried very hard, what happened here? So uh, there is one point that I want to make very clear because very often the Galileo story is described as if this was a clash between science and religion. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, and he never saw it as such. He, he was, was a religious, yeah. He was a religious person himself. And he in fact stated that scripture could not make any errors. The clash was between scientific findings and a literal interpretation of the biblical text. Mm -hmm. And Galileo tried to emphasize in every possible way that the Bible was written for our salvation, not as a science book. And, and he gave examples. He said, look, even the planets are not named there. So clearly it's not a, meant to be a science book. And, you know, his strongest point was that he didn't believe that the same God who gave us our senses and intelligence and reason wanted us to abandon their use. Uh, so, you know, he, he said, when there appears to be a conflict between a literal interpretation of the biblical text and science, it means that our interpretation is wrong and we should change the interpretation. This was his point, and that was the point, by the way, which Pope John Paul II eventually accepted. He said that he was right and the theologians were wrong because they didn't understand the difference between the biblical text and its interpretation. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so this was the, the actual point, and indeed he got in trouble because, you know, at the time, uh, there were still people on the Catholic side. By the way, uh, Protestants uh, pretty much, you know, uh, moved away a, a little bit from, from all of that. And uh, 
you know, Kepler himself, we you know, was a Lutheran in the right. and he accepted the Copernican model, and there were many others, yeah. Right. Uh, so but it, so it seemed to be it seemed to be that it was that authority at that time. It actually continued for a very long time. It is the taken as a challenge to the church authority. Galileo was sort of focused on something else there and then struggled with that authority of the church. And I should bring out that this is a time when there are many Protestant movements developing ever since Luther uh, much earlier, right? And so you really have a long uh, time period of change here, and it had a lot to do with the authority of the church, almost more than religion, perhaps. Okay, so anyway, Galileo had to struggle with this, and it all ended up in this horrific trial, uh, and the consequences of that. Could you tell us about that? Yeah, so, you know, he wrote this book, uh, you know, Dialogue on the Two yeah. Systems, which was written as a conversation among three people, uh, one of whom is kind of a standing for Galileo himself and expresses the Copernican view. One of them is uh, represents uh, the Aristotelian view, and one is sort of a neutral, uh, lay person, but educated person who tries to judge between the, the, the two. Uh, the problem was that in the entire book, uh, Galileo basically ridiculed the Aristotelian <laughs> guy. He also gave him the name Simplicio, which on one hand took from somebody who was actually existed and was an Aristotelian, uh, but also has the sort of connotation of a simpleton. Uh, uh, he, also, he, he also made a little bit of the mistake of putting <laughs> the words of the Pope himself, Pope Urban VIII, in the mouth of this Simplicio uh, person. So anyhow, the whole book he ridiculed Simplicio. Uh, but then he realized he couldn't publish it like that because he needed to get permission from the Catholic Church to print it. So he added the preface and the conclusion, which sort of negated almost all the book <laughs> by saying, oh, well, actually we don't know, God is almighty, he could do things any way he wants and so on. The problem was that anybody who actually read the whole book <laughs> would see that the preface and the authorities and the did. <laughs> were somewhat of an afterthought. <laughs> so look, uh, the result, I mean, we're laughing, but the result was bad. Uh, the result yes. was that he was put on trial. And he was put on trial in some sense justifiably because 17 years earlier, there was an injunction against him put by the commissary general saying that he couldn't uh, support the Copernican view, couldn't talk about this, couldn't teach it, and so on. Now, Galileo had a slightly milder version of that injunction from Cardinal Roberto Bellarmino, uh, which said that he couldn't hold or support that, could, didn't say he couldn't talk about it or teach. And, he tried to rely on that, uh, but that didn't help him. So, you know, in some sense, the church in its authority, I mean, you could argue, why did they even have the authority to tell him what he can talk, do and not? Uh, you know, in today's, it looks horrible, of course, in terms of intellectual freedom, but that's how it was then. Mm -hmm. So he was put on trial for that. And in the trial, he was found vehemently suspected of heresy, which is just one step down from being outright heretical, which have been punishable by being burnt at the stake, mm -hmm. which is what happened to Giordano Bruno in 1600 while yeah. Galileo was alive. Yeah. Uh, uh, so now, because he was just found vehemently suspected of heresy, he was asked uh, to provide an abjuration, on his knees, you know, and so on. And uh, it, it's a really a sad story in the history of science, of course, and eventually was uh, sentenced to house arrest for the last eight years or so of his life, um, 
it, he was never, even though the sentence mentioned the possibility of torture and things like that, nobody really intended to torture Galileo. I mean, he was almost 70 years old, you know, it, 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 that was unlikely. Uh, but he was put on house arrest. He was allowed to have visitors, but they had to be approved uh, by the Pope. Um, look, I mean, now with the pandemic, uh, you know, we're, we're sitting at home <laughs> for two years and we go crazy. Right. Uh, he was on house arrest for like eight years, you know, uh, so this couldn't have been easy for him, even though it was in his own house. Uh, well, the first six months he spent elsewhere. Um, uh, and, and that was it. Um, his books were put on the index uh, of uh, prohibited books, yeah. and they didn't go off the index until the middle of the 19th century. Um, so, so that was, of course, a sad story in itself. And really, his sentence had a chilling effect on the progress of science, especially in Italy, but, but even in other places. I mean, uh, you know, we have this letter that uh, René Descartes, the famous scientist and philosopher, wrote, where he, how shocked he was to hear about Galileo's sentence and, and, and so on. So, so uh, it, it certainly is a sad uh, event in the history of science. Yes, it, it just seems that he was cut off, his, his books were condemned. I thought they were burned at some point as well. You know, he was not allowed to publish a lot of things. He could not get out and communicate. This was a man who had traveled and so on. I guess he was ill at this time as well. Yeah, he, yeah, he, he was that, actually quite sickly, to be honest, for, from age about 40. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, he had, he, had con he had all the time all kinds of rheumatic things and this. And of course, the last four years of his life, he was almost totally blind. Yes, on top of everything else. Yeah. So that was, it, it's just hard to imagine one of the great forces in science being treated this way, you know? But you, you make a very interesting story of it. It's just the best one out there, I think. But the additional thing that is so important in your book is how, and it's so timely, is how you compare his situation with the anti-science that persists today. Now, you expect this at some level, always, perhaps, but we're in a time where we can't afford to be anti-science. The answers for our problems are in science. So could you give us uh, uh, some background on that, what you yeah. are yeah. saying in your book? It's terribly important. Yeah, look, I I'll be honest. I mean, one of, one of the main reasons for me to write this book about Galileo was that I was alarmed by the level of science denial that we see today. Yes. Um, and, they are not, and they are not the same uh, yeah. in the sense that, as I said, right. in this case, it was this clash between literal interpretation of scripture and this. Uh, that exists to some extent today, especially yes. with those who deny Darwinian evolution and so exactly. on. Exactly. Uh, but but most of the objections that science denial today has to do with political or economical yes. reasons, uh, not to wanting to change way of life and things like that. Uh, but largely political. Um, uh, you know, for example, you know, we are now witnessing in, in the case of the pandemic. I mean, this is just yes. this is just to me almost unbelievable what has happened. I mean, you know, how can people even talk like this? You know, when you say, people say, oh, this is my own body, I'll do what I want. Well, it's not true. I mean, yes. you're not allowed, allowed to, to drive while being drunk, right? Yes. Uh, yeah. Why? Because you're a danger not only to yourself, but to others. Yes. The same is true about being vaccinated or wearing a mask you know, and things like this. These are not political issues. These are public health issues. Exactly. But unfortunately, they have become that. Uh, right. Climate change, yes, climate change. I mean, do we need any more evidence <laughs> of what's happening with the climate? I mean, don't we see with the fires and the strengthening hurricanes and all that and so on? I mean, even if you 
are not convinced by the scientific evidence that this is done by humans. Clearly, the human activity is not helping this situation. This should be very, very obvious. Yes. And, 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 and so uh, this was, is a point I wanted to make uh, and, and to make the comparison with Galileo. And, and look, in his case, to be honest, I mean, whether the earth moves around the sun or the sun around the earth does not <laughs> change uh, how people live. Uh, but to, it is never a good idea to bet against the judgment of science. Why? Not because science is always right, but because science continuously corrects itself. Exactly. Science can be wrong, but it continuously corrects itself. Now, to bet against the judgment of science in cases where human life is at stake, like in the case of a pandemic, or when the future of the Earth's biosphere is at stake, as in the case of climate, is really unconscionable. I mean, uh, so uh, that's partly why, why I decided to write the book. Uh, you uh, know, and, only yeah. it will have a small effect. I, I hope it does. And you're, you've done this in a culture, one of the, the top economic successes of world history, you know, in a very wealthy country with loads of scientists and so forth, and a country in the United States that does not have an education policy of, of a uh, a national curriculum, in other words, so that some states can continue to teach intelligent design, either in place of or beside evolution. We have a flat earth society in the United States. That's kind of hard to believe. We have the right to resist science, which is a very strange thing that that's treated in the media as kind of an equal voice, an equal right or something, but you very cleverly refer to some of this as the Galileo gambit in your book, which I thought was very clever of how of the, that's a false argument by say the climate deniers in especially, a very serious situation. And incidentally, it's notable that a lot of the denialism today is centered in the right wings of all the major religions. I find that quite interesting, but uh, here it's Protestantism, than whatever, you know, in this country, but in other countries you see the same sort of thing. And so that resistance, it continues from the very long past. Also, no, I mean, uh, I, and I don't want to put it only there. I mean, you know, yeah, there right. are people <laughs> on the extreme left who also resist uh, yes. you know, scientific yes, sure. things and so on. So uh, the problem is that, like I said, there are topics which really should have nothing to do with politics. Uh, I, I, I mean, you know, right now we are, I, I, I don't even follow anymore the latest numbers, but I believe we're quickly approaching 700,000 Yes, deaths we are, and it's the most in the from, world. From, 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 from this pandemic. Uh, so how can people, I mean, you, you know, you don't have to follow the science to, in every detail. S look before the pandemic, before this pandemic, when you looked at doctors and nurses in hospitals, didn't mm -hmm. they always wear masks? Yes. Of course they did. Why did they wear masks? They wear masks because they protect themselves yes. and the patients, right? Good I mean, point. This, this has been well known for <laughs> decades, even before this pandemic. So why should anybody object to wearing a mask uh, when, when it is well, by now proven that it can actually save lives. Now, vaccines, we are so lucky that a vaccine has been developed. So and quickly, yes. It, yeah, it could have been that, uh, you, you know, and, and, and not only that, you know, it, it's even the previous administration that actually worked to get the vaccine. Okay, mm -hmm. so now there is the vaccine, get the vaccine. <laughs>
right? But that that has persisted since vaccines were available. You get the same problem over and over again. Uh, so it, it becomes kind of irrational, but uh, you've made a, just a wonderful point of this resistance. Where does this resistance come from? Why does this resistance persist today in, you know, a, a culture, cultures where there's much more education and so on. So in a sense, there's no excuse. We are running out of time. And I have one thing more to say, please. And that is, I hope you will get out there and talk to audiences a lot uh, because, and I hope they make a program like Nova on just this because it is such an important topic. It's a very good reminder and it's a very brilliant book. And uh, of course, you've written a lot of very brilliant books. Uh, I hope that this sort of sinks in, in a way. And I want to just close with asking you for your prognosis. What do you think the future looks like if we don't get a handle on accepting science? Uh, yeah, unfortunately, I cannot say that I'm extremely optimistic. Yeah. And the reason is that there have by now been many psychological studies which show that once adults formed an opinion, it is extremely difficult to change it. So I, I think that there are only two ways that I, I, I can think of uh, to combat this. Uh, one is that we really have to start with education of small children. And not, not that they all need to be scientists, absolutely not. I mean, God forbid, we need the poets, the philosophers, the, the exactly. humanities, we need all of that. But everybody needs to appreciate what science does for us. Everyone needs to understand that the reason we don't have polio today is because of vaccines. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, the reason we have a GPS in our phone is because we, we both have quantum mechanics and also we have uh, Einstein's general relativity and special relativity and, and things like that. So everybody, they don't need to know how that works necessarily. I but to understand what science has done for us, to understand that today we live twice, life expectancy is twice what it was in Galileo's time, and it's only because of science. So that's one thing. We start with small children. The other thing is to try, and you know, I see them trying to do this now with the pandemic to some extent. People get more convinced if you bring them somebody who once had the other opinion and changed their minds. So I think it's a good idea to show, you know, all these people who unfortunately are suffering from the pandemic and say, look, I was against vaccines before, but please get the vaccine. Uh, uh, there is a reason why in my book, I bring at the end the evidence from two popes <laughs> who say that Galileo was right and the church yes. was wrong. Uh, yes. So, you know, because these were the people who were against him and, you know, now the popes have changed their mind. So we need to get more of this, but we need to get them at the higher level. Yes. Uh, you, you, you know, as long as people at the highest levels, you know, if there are governors of states who object to vaccines or things like or that. presidents that, of countries. <laughs> that's, not, that's not good, you know. I mean, uh, that is not good. You need to have them in higher places uh, because, uh, you know, the internet has been fantastic in many ways, but it had also been way, bad in some ways. Right. In the sense that if somebody today is against vaccines, he or she will be able to find on the internet some opinion, even of a scientist, that yes. is against vaccines. Yes, because you know there, there's everything there, uh, so you can find it. So you need to know that there are sources you can trust, and yes. others not. If you want to know about things that have to do with health, look at the website of the Mayo Clinic, or you know, look at the website of the CDC. Don't right. look at just what. Some Joe Schmo in uh, I don't know where in, in Indonesia, you know, said about the vaccine. Um, so yeah, so these are the types of things we can try to do. But I cannot say that I am 
over-optimistic because it is difficult. It is. It is. It's taken centuries to get <laughs> even this far. Dr. Livio, you are wonderful to give us all this information and really appreciate it. I hope people will read this book. It is enlightening in many respects, and especially this uh, connection between our situation today with denialism and the denialism of the very remote past uh, for which Galileo was finally forgiven, I think, in the, what was it, 19, it was very late. 92, 1992. <laughs> 1992. It took 350 years, but eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so it took a while. I, we don't have that kind of time today for uh, the people that are denying the, cli the climate science and denying vaccines and so on. Again, Dr. Livio, thank you ever so much for joining us, giving us your time today. And I wish you all the best with this book. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>